railroad cars. Hmm? Very heavy springs. Okay, um, so let's just have a, a quick view of um, uh, the, the, the wire uh, mill part. Mm -hmm. um, in an integrated uh, steel uh, plant, you, you will, of course, use um, uh, steel from high purity steel coming from blast furnace and uh, uh, basic oxygen BOF uh, furnace. And then you go continuous casting. Mm -hmm. and there it depends what, you, uh, what your continuous caster can do. Um, if, it's, uh, if it makes um, uh, blooms, you usually need to turn these into billets, yes? Uh, square or round billets, yes, uh, via a blooming mill and um, billet mill, hmm? or or you make if you have multi-strand, uh, if you can make if you have a, a caster that can make multi-strand, uh, circular or square uh, billets, uh, you you of course don't need to do uh, the blooming, yes, and you go straight uh, to the uh, reheating furnace, yes. Now. Depending on the product, yes, there will be more or less ta care taken of the surface of uh, these billets. Hmm? So if uh, the application is, uh, requires it, yeah, um, you will, for instance, do ultrasound testing of your billet. Hmm? So you'll, you'll be looking for defects uh, in the, the structure that, that are not visible, hmm? slightly uh, below the surface. And um, you can also do billet conditioning. That means you uh, basically uh, remove uh, oxides and surface defects and decarburization layers on top of your billet so you have a, uh, a perfectly conditioned billet. Now these billets then go into the reheating furnace hmm? um, and Similarly to what, what we've seen for, for strip mills, yeah, although it's, 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 it looks different, of course, uh, you do a roughing mill, yes, and then an intermediate mill and a finishing mill. Yeah? Um, and in the case of uh, wire, uh, we have the special uh, cooling table, which we'll be discussing in a moment, where you do... Uh, the transformation mm, that would be the equivalent of say the runout table and the cooling um, in the runout table for hot strip mill. Okay, so let's have a look at what uh, uh, production levels we have here. Yes, um, typical a um, the reheating furnace will have capacities of around 100 tons, 8,200 tons per hour. The amount of steel that is being processed. The yearly production of a uh, normal uh, wire and bar uh, production is usually from 350 to 500 uh, tons, 1,000 tons per year. So uh, typically about a little less than half a million tons a year. The billets that we uh, use uh, to start are uh, so 12 to 18 centimeter in, uh, in section. Mm -hmm. Rolling speeds depends, of course, uh, at, uh, on the type of product you make. If you make very small wire, yes, the, ro the, the, the rolling speed at the exit will be very high, mm -hmm. uh, 100 meters per second. Mm -hmm. uh, if you make bar, yes, uh, or bar in coil, that's bar that's um, the section of which is small enough so you can still coil it, yes, um, 20 meters per second. Hmm. Um, well, typical uh, products that are uh, made are uh, wire rod, bar and coil, and bar. Hmm. Bar being, uh, it's too thick and the application doesn't allow you to bend it. Yeah? And uh, uh, typical section diameters, so uh, wire Typically, wire rod would be uh, five millimeters to twenty millimeters. Yes, mm -hmm. um, the uh, bar in coil 
14 to 60 uh, millimeters, about six centimeters, yes. And the round bars is that you don't bend. Well, it depends on the application again. If it, um, uh, the section can be uh, smaller than the bar in color, of course, it's just what the application demands, whether you can coil it or not. Typical volume of a, um, a bar, uh, wire and bar uh, production unit um, is that you, you don't make one single type of product in general. So you, it's, it's kind of spread out over uh, about 50% goes into wire rod, yes. And then bars are either um, uh, in coil or not in coil. And, and there it's about half and half. Half will be coiled, half will be uh, just straight bars, yes. What's also important here is that um, these um, uh, production units do not necessarily make only carbon steels. Yes, they can also be involved in producing other types of steels. Uh, so typically, the majority of the products will be carbon steels. But uh, you may uh, f find uh, uh, wire and bar steel uh, production units, which which uh, produce also the same products, the same type of products, but stainless st using stainless steels. Yes. So you, you, uh, there is uh, more variation in, in uh, the type of compositions that you use. Okay. So the the, the, ba the basic layout is, uh, as I said, the reheating furnace. You see a picture of a reheating furnace. Yes. Um, the uh, uh, billets come in at one side, come, come out through this much smaller, of course, uh, exit port, yes. Um, the reheated billets um, come out and then they go through a roughing mill, hmm? a roughing mill. And we'll see in a moment that the roughing, uh, the, um, the, the, the process of uh, rolling uh, wire and uh, bar products goes through uh, uh, special uh, uh, mills, yes, uh, with alternating uh, vertical and horizontal stands, yes? Uh, roughing mill, intermediate mill, and then the finishing. And then you have lines that will do uh, the um, uh, transformation, excuse me, the, um, the, the cooling of a um, uh, of the straight uh, uh, bar in a, um, on a cooling bed. Uh, if you have bars in coils or wires, you will um, uh, have the, uh, the wire rods are, are usually uh, heat treated as they come out of the, uh, the, the finisher and the bars in coil uh, can be heat treated or uh, transformed after that. All right. So um, this is here the, uh, the finisher. Yeah. And so you can see the section of the um, uh, the product decreasing as you go through the um, uh, unit. This is a um, uh, an intermediate uh, part of a wire and bar uh, mill, and you can see here that you see the rolls are in this case a vertical uh, horizontal. Excuse me, horizontal. In this case, they are vertical. And then here, they're again horizontal and vertical, okay, et cetera. And um, so the um, uh, reason is you, um, you cannot make the, um, if you have two rolls, yes, you cannot make the, um, and, and, you, and uh, you start with the big section, yes, you cannot make the, um, the final section, yes, by uh, doing a, a circular, uh, changing the, um, the, um, the section in a circular manner. And, and it, the reason is, is, is because you, you're rolling basically, right? So if, you, if you're rolling things, um, they will tend to, to, to assume this shape, yes? And um, so the way it works, you, um, you basically uh, have oval shapes, yes, as you, as you do the, the reduction of the, um, 
the section. There are many steps, many more steps in uh, the um, deformation. Uh, uh, this is a case with, which would be a more um, uh, old-fashioned uh, case where you have a blooming male. Remember, that's, that's where you have a heavy, uh, heavier uh, section, such as ingots, or you have a bloom. That's a, so uh, nowadays, because of the... Uh, uh, continuous casting, lots of this blooming is uh, not necessary anymore. You can just basically cast directly the bar, yes, or the billet in the right size. Hmm? Okay, so that reduces the amounts, the, the number of, of stands that you need uh, to have, okay? Yes, but uh, here you can see, and, and the evolution can be uh, quite dramatic. This is, for instance, an example here where it goes um, oval, square, oval. Yes, it depends very much on uh, the technology that's installed. Hmm? And this is an example here where you go from oval, round, oval, round. Yeah? But the, 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 the basic point being that um, you, you don't go from uh, the starting situation, which may be a, a square billet, to uh, the end situation uh, via continuous uh, diameter reduction. You go through these uh, non-rectangular um, sections. Yeah? Okay. Uh, it's not the case um, when, of course, you, uh, you're towards the end of the process where your, your product usually has to have a very perfect uh, round or square. I mean, I will, I'm only talking here about the uh, round shapes, but if you need square shapes, it's the same thing. So there, and, and that's what happens in the, in the, the, the finishing uh, uh, mill, yes, you have um, uh, five or six stands or maybe more where you, um, where you generate the final shape, the final required shape. And in this case, um, your, um, your stands will uh, make, in this case, the circular sections, yes? And you can have uh, two high uh, round passes like this one or th uh, three roll round passes like this one here. Hmm? Okay, so you've got, and, and here these, in the finishing mill when you have these three roll reducing and, and sizing blocks that we call them, uh, we don't really call them stands, um, the um, you have the, uh, the rolls are oriented in Y positions and anti-Y positions, yes? So as to have, see, when you, um, when you roll, every time you roll like this, hmm, uh, you will always have a little bit of uh, material that will be squeezed out and uh, so and that is why the you usually turn you go from um, a vertical to a horizontal situation or from a Y situation to anti Y situation because in the next stand in the next stand you'll be doing the rolling this way yeah? Yeah, I'll be doing the rolling this way, okay? And so here, of course, you'll have a, uh, still a little bit of um, uh, material that you, uh, you don't, this material doesn't really get squeezed out. It's just because it's an opening, it doesn't get reduced, yes? Some people think this material gets kind of gets like pushed out uh, from between the rolls, that's not really what happens. It's just you don't roll it, so it's not reducing. Um, yeah. um, so, so um, and, and so the squeezing out is reduced a lot, and, and also, uh, and it's even better with these uh, three roll reducing and sizing blocks. Yes. Okay. Yes, and this is an example of how how things uh, look like. Okay, and this is a typical 
example here. It's a, a, a slightly older setup, um, uh, and you can see uh, there are one, two, three, uh, let me see, uh, one, two, three, four, five, about five um, of these uh, blocks, yes? Um, the company that makes those is, is very famous, yes, because it, uh, it basically owns the technology for these um, three-roll reducing and sizing blocks, and it's called Cox from um, uh, 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 Germany. Hmm? And, it's, it's, uh, and um, so that's very often the type of equipment that you find uh, at the end of a um, bar or wire uh, mill. Um, again, here we won't go into this, but obviously you, uh, you understand that we uh, have a, um, a section material that has uh, this kind of section, yes? And you have to turn it into uh, maybe something that's just a few millimeters or uh, in diameter, right? So things become very, very long, yes, in a bar mill, yes, very long. And so, and you go from uh, one stand to another stand to another stand. So there'll be, it's, um, you, you remember when we talked about the hot strip mill, you always have problems, you, 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 not problems, but you have to deal with the fact that uh, you may have tension, yes, uh, between uh, the uh, both, and you need to have, of course, constant uh, mass throughput. Yes, if if uh, if you know, one one mill produces more, uh, has a higher velocity, exit velocity, then the next mill uh, has a um, entry velocity. You're going to accumulate uh, material in your mill, and you end up with with cobbles. Yes, and it can be pretty horrible when this happens because uh, you, know, you get this, this very high temperature spaghetti um, all over the place, yes? And, uh, and once it's cooled, uh, you have to you know, remove it and uh, so cut it up. It's, it's a terrible loss of time. Um, so uh, these mills, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you an example of this in a moment, uh, do take this into uh, consideration for the, um, the processing. So, um, of course, when you uh, make bar, the section is much larger than in, uh, this is a larger section, yes. Uh, you don't need as many stands. In, in fact, um, you may just have a few uh, roughing stands. Hmm? So, for instance, uh, if you make a round bar, the mill will have a heating furnace uh, you, ha you can have a, a blooming mill, perhaps, yes? Uh, but you will have then going to a, a roughing mill, an intermediate mill, and a finishing mill can be one mill position, yeah? With different um, uh, stands, yeah? where, where the, the bar goes back and forth till it's got the right uh, section. Hmm? Um, so, so typically, machine structural parts uh, that use um, that are based on uh, these bars will will be produced this way. In the wire mill, of course, um, we we have much uh, smaller reductions, larger reductions. Excuse me. So you go from heating furnace. There may or may not be this reversing rougher that's similar to this one. Yes. It depends on, on what we start with, yes? And then you go through uh, the intermediate mill and this, uh, wire rod blocks where uh, all the, the stands are in tandem, okay? So again, I, I want to um, uh, mention the fact that uh, all these mills, the material comes in, goes through uh, one stand goes through another stand. And so how do you manage uh, the, uh, the material flow, the mass flow through the, li the, the line, yes? Um, nowadays, what uh, is being done is, is tension-free rolling, yes? 
you basically have something that's, that's reminiscent of a looper, a looper between the stands, rolling stands of a finishing mill. Yes. So, and in this case, the uh, the loop that you have is such that you eliminate the tension. So there is no tension between uh, the uh, in the uh, the wire. Yes between the stands. So this way we are able to provide at the exit a constant exit velocity. It's constant. It's constant. This, this exit velocity is constant. And that is rather important because of the heat the, the, the heat treatment or the cooling that's being done after the finishing mill. Yeah. This uh, heat treatment requires a constant exit speed for the for the cooling bed or for the what the, the cooling bed is what is basically the, the name we use for the runout, uh, the equivalent of the runout table in the hot strip mill, the cooling bed. And uh, this exit speed must be synchronized with one a part that. Uh, and you'll see that in a moment what it looks like, the part that puts down the, uh, the wire on the cooling bed, and that's a laying head, hmm? laying head. And that's a, a rather slow uh, uh, equipment. It, it, it will, it's not really able to respond to um, exit uh, velocity changes, yes? So it's critical to keep uh, the uh, the exit velocity uh, constant. Okay. A wire mill can make a very large, um, not only a um, uh, wide selection of diameters, but a very large number of diameters. Yes. So, for instance, this is an example here of. Uh, a situation where a wire mill can make uh, sections going from about uh, 19 millimeters to 75 millimeters. Yeah? So, and, uh, and so you can see the ranges, the actual ranges of the actual uh, diameters that it can make. Yes? Now the way it m makes it is by combining different stands, yes, and in these stands having uh, different types of rolls, yes. So there is uh, a very large number of uh, uh, rolls that you need to manage in these wire and bar mills, yes. You don't, it's not like a hot strip mill where you pr always have the same work roll and uh, backup roll. Uh, for a certain stand here, it depends on what you're going to produce, yes? And so for instance here you can see uh, in this mill, uh, in this particular mill you have uh, oval and round uh, changes, yes? And um, if, if you um, want to make, um, say, the exit uh, rougher diameter is 115 millimeters, so about uh, 10 centimeters, and you want to make a 35 millimeter uh, wire out of this, well, this is the sequence that will have to be mounted, yes? So, okay. So, th so that means that um, you have to set up the mill uh, for uh, specific uh, products, yes? Now, you realize, of course, that um, when you're making a wire, yes, there's only one wire that goes through the line, right? So, uh, if you make small wire, its the productivity is low, okay? So, um, for products, now, uh, 
very often that's what you have to live with because you need to make products um, with certain specifications in terms of uh, the dimensions. You know, if, if they ask you to make a, a five uh, or one uh, centimeter diameter uh, bar, it shouldn't be 1.3 or, or sometimes one, you know, it's got to be that dimension, yes? So uh, uh, there's not much you can do. But there are products which are commodity products, yes, where the demands are less, yes, and where you can, uh, wh and, and of course the cost, uh, the, the prices are much less. So there it's important to increase productivity. Yeah? And so there are possibilities to do this. Hmm? For instance, um, uh, if you, um, uh, if you have a rebar, for instance, it's a commodity product, yes, uh, you can, you, there are units that will allow you to uh, make three bars or more, or more bars in parallel. This is an example here where you have uh, about a, a centimeter large rebar, yes, and it's produced here in this unit that um, that split it's a uh, bar splitting unit yes and you enter uh, with something that looks like this yes and after this unit it's you you know it's split in these uh, rebars yes and so the the amount of material you produce the amount of bars you produce uh, per uh, unit of time is increased yes so that, that allows you, but of course you can only use it for large production volumes, smaller rebar sizes, and obviously um, the, um, uh, we, we're talking about um, commodity products here. Um, temperature control, as always, very important with, with uh, steel, certainly uh, carbon steels, <coughs> yes. So typically, uh, a typical uh, uh, mill uh, temperature profile will be uh, a reheating at 1100 uh, for 20 minutes. So uh, remember um, that uh, slabs in the hot strip mill are uh, two hours at 1250. Yes, so this is uh, much shorter. One of the reasons is, of course, that um, these billets are much smaller than these huge slabs, yes? No? Okay. And the temperature uh, decreases slowly as you go through the line, yes? Mm -hmm. You end up uh, with relatively simple rules when it comes, and we'll discuss those, when it comes to how you cool the uh, wire after uh, it's been uh, produced. So, um, and, and so we'll see, so first you have a, a cooling to, from the um, deformation temperature to about uh, 910, yes, and then you do what, what's called Stelmore cooling, yes, um, to typically 570, and we'll see that uh, that temperature is the temperature that we like to uh, carry out the perlite transformation, yes? And then you, you air cool the material. Again, as always, in a, um, in a uh, steel uh, hot uh, production area, hmm, uh, the temperature is not homogeneous at the surface and the interior of the material. Hmm? So if you look at the surface, you get the blue profile here. So you have the roughing mill, the intermediate mill, yes, um, and every time you go through the mill, you get cooling from, uh, from the mill, yes, so the surface is, is cool. Uh, at the very center of the material, it's a very different story. Uh, every time you, you pass through the deformation stages, you get uh, heating, the material heats up in the center, yeah, so that uh, when, when you get out of the uh, the, the mills, the surface temperature increases again, yes, and, and, and this is the actual, uh, say, average temperature. Yeah? So in, at the end, um, when you uh, come 
to the uh, to having to do the transformation. Yes, there will so there, you will have to apply cooling, and these are these cooling stages. Yes, uh, that are used at the exit of uh, on on the the wire after the exit from the mill. Hmm? Okay, so what? Why do we need to do this? Well, first of all, um, the um, the wire steels that we make are very often um, steels that contain where, or where perlite is a very important constituent. Yes, and so let's just uh, let's just make uh, we'll, we'll go into details in the products. But one of the the, the products that are being made um, uh, with uh, wire are what we call cold heading steels, cold heading quality steels, uh, CHQ. And that's um, uh, or, or steel for fasteners. Bolts are fastener, nails are fasteners, yes. Mm -hmm. So um, typically have 0.3 to 0.5 carbon in these steels, yes. So when you cool this steel, mm -hmm. let's say uh, 0.4, yes, you cool this steel, mm -hmm. um, what uh, uh, you get, of course, it's it's a uh, discontinuous uh, cooling. So you get this is your cooling curve. Yes, you get a CCT diagram. Yes, and you see that the the transformation. If you do a slow cooling, transformation starts at 700. There is a transformation that starts at 700. Yes, and if I use a high cooling rate of 50, the transformation is starting around 600 degrees C. Yes? So um, temperatures that are much lower than what the phase diagram tells you. Okay? Okay? If you look at the temperature now yes, in the uh, uh, wire, yes, you see that when the transformation starts here at these red lines, yes, um, and this would be for this temperature here, you see that the temperature, the transformation starts, the, the temperature increases. Yeah? And that this, is, this phenomenon is called re recalescence, yes? And it's basically the heat of transformation that's released and that gives you uh, a slight increase in the temperature, yeah? And then what happens in terms of the uh, transformation, yes? Well, first, uh, you can see here, of course, as soon as we pass the AR E3 temperature, yes, uh, there is, uh, you can form some ferrites, and that's what happens. You form some initial amount of ferrite, yes. But the bulk of the transformation here, going from here to here, is the perlite transformation. Hmm? And 80% of the microstructure will be. Um, more than 80% in this particular case will be uh, perlite. Hmm? So the uh, fast uh, cooling and the low transformation temperatures are very important for wire products because that gives us the best uh, microstructure for strength. Yes. So there are different ways you, you can do this. Let's say, for instance, you you do the cooling uh, with forced air, yeah, which would be about 10 degrees per second, or you can do the cooling in a, a, a metal bath. Yeah. Um, uh, for instance, lead, lead bath. Lead is, uh, doesn't react with steel, and you can, you can use it as a cooling medium, yes? Um, it also has very low, um, it has a low um, uh, melting temperature, yes? So you can basically heat it up. And the advantage is it doesn't evaporate, yes? Uh, it doesn't alloy with the steel. Uh, and, um, and it's a um, very good heat conductor, so you can, um, you can uh, cool the, your steel to the temperature of your bath uh, very nicely. So this is what you get. If you cool your steel in lead, 20 degrees per second, forced air, yes. And you can look at the, uh, uh, the, the strength that you get for the same material, 
yes? When you do the, uh, the, the transformation, yes, in uh, the sled or in the forced air cooling. Hmm? So the mean temperature for transformation, the mean temperature transformation in forced air is around uh, 640. In the lead, yes, it's around 600 or lower, yes? Uh, very often this, this treatment in uh, lead is called patenting. It's just it's basically using um, lead as a low temperature uh, cooling medium hmm, with a high uh, uh, cooling rate. Hmm. And you see that uh, we can achieve an impressive increase in, uh, in strength just by doing the transformation at higher rates and lower temperatures, okay? So that is one method that is used by the steel maker to increase strength, yes? Is transformation at lower temperatures, yes? And higher cooling rates, yeah? When the, the products are made, yes? Uh, we can also increase the strength even further by reducing, continuing to reduce the interlamellar spacing of the perlite, yes? And that's done by deformation, yes? So if, if you take a, one of these materials, let's go back, hmm? uh, for instance, you see here forced air cooling, lead patenting, gives me about tensile strength around a thousand, yeah? around a thousand, yeah? so that would be uh, somewhere here, yes? If I draw this material, yes, I, I get an increase in, um, in um, strain, in strain, of course, and I get a reduction, a refinement of the, the perlite. And you can see here, very large uh, increase in strength, yeah? almost three times, and, you know, starting from 1,000, you get close to three gigapascal. And there, it's also important to have a very small starting microstructure to do this. Okay. Okay. So how does this? How do you do? How do you actually carry this out? The this tra transforming the uh, all this wire that comes out at uh, you know up to uh, 100 meters per second. How do, you, how do you do the transformation? How do you manage this? Well, there's a clever way in which it's being done um, with, a, with this, uh, this piece of equipment here, yes? The, the wire comes in as a wire, yes? And this machine turns it into a spiral, yes? Spiral-shaped uh, wire. So instead of having straight wire, it now comes out as a spiral. Yes, you can see come it, it coming it coming out of, a uh, of the machine, this laying head as a spiral. And then you put it down on a cooling table. Yes, and you can see here these are all, uh, 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 this is the wire that's laid down, yes, on a cooling table. So this is the... Uh, the, the top view of the um, uh, this um, cooling table, mm -hmm. and you see here the the rings of the wire. Yes, and it's uh, carried by a conveyor chain you know, that that uh, takes it along over the the cooling section. The cooling section itself, view from the side, so you can see here. You have the, uh, these rings, yes, that are put on top of each other. And below, th so it's open, yes, it's open. This, this conveyor belt is open. And you have uh, fans that blow air through it, yeah? Okay. And so uh, that will give you a cooling. You can control the cooling by having a, a cover, yes, a put a cover on top of the, um, 
the rings so that they, the cooling rate is, is less. It's uh, right. And so we can adjust the cooling rate on this table. Okay. So this is a picture here. This is the laying head. This is the ring wires as they uh, are, go on the, uh, the wire rings as they are on the um, conveyor belt. And here you see this, um, the covers, um, the covers here that you can put down over this, over your um, uh, cooling section to uh, decrease the cooling rate, yes? And so as, as the, um, uh, the wire cools down, yes? Uh, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's not uh, red anymore, red hot anymore. And at the end, we can form these coils, yes? By putting them over uh, this um, cone here, yes? Uh, for f and for final cooling. And then you can make these, um, these coils of uh, wire. So this is for uh, how you produce uh, uh, wire, yes? Uh, but in the case of bar, um, the, the amount of deformation, the amount of reduction is, is, is much smaller, yes? Yes? And, um, and the, the uh, there's a little bit uh, shift in emphasis when you make bar, certainly bar, uh, for instance, bright bar, such as the, the one you see here. Hmm? So again, you, you start with heating the uh, billets, you force them, or usually you roll them, yes, so that they uh, have the right um, uh, general uh, dimensions, yes. They're usually uh, then annealed and pre-aligned, yes. Then we have bar peeling, yes. Again, this is not for all kinds of bars, not for rebars, for instance, for bright bars that are used in uh, uh, machine parts, yes. Or, or motors, yes. Um, the bar peeling, you remove oxide, the skin, the generally the chilled skin is because the outer side may have cooled down uh, faster and be, uh, for instance, martensitic, and so you want to remove it. You also may want to remove surface cracks so that you can achieve dimensional accuracy and high surface finish. Um, the bars are very many applications they have to be uh, very straight hmm? so you have to straighten them and then uh, in many applications you also want to the ends the quality of the ends of the bar has to be assured you, to have certain uh, finishes so you, you we're talking about chamfering and end facing I'll, sh I'll show you an example for bars uh, are typically fully tested ultrasonically, so to detect cracks and imperfections inside the material, and then marked, and if it's required by the application, there may even be a final grinding uh, of the bar to get uh, high quality surfaces. Yeah. So uh, you have to imagine now these, these bars that come out of the, um, um, the mill, yes, they will pass through, the first pass through a unit that does the peeling, yes. And I, I don't have really a good picture of the, the process, but basically these bar enter the peeling machine and there is a turning head in the in peeling machine with carbide tools, yes, that will remove, it turns or spins around and it removes at very high speed, it removes all these uh, the, the surface layer, basically. Mm? It removes oxide, etc. Mm? And it gives you very high, again, uh, dimensional quality. Mm? All right. And uh, some of the bars require, will require drawing, so uh, lengthening. Uh, so you can lengthen the, the bar and get a uh, reduction in section this way. Hmm? You can have um, straight uh, drawing, it can happen by spinning, or if the, um, or, or, or you can basically uh, draw uh, the rods, 
yes? When you do this drawing, so you basically have a uh, circular tool with uh, cylindrical tool with a hole in, yes? You pass your wire uh, or your bar through it, yes? And um, when you do this, it's very, it's of critical importance, yes, that uh, the force with which you pull, and in particular the angle here, the angle of the tool is uh, chosen very carefully. Why is that? Because if you don't do this, you get what are called chevron defects in the bar. So these are chevron defects and which you can basically see these are cracks, internal cracks. So the, the bar looks perfect from the outside, but internally you have uh, these chevron defects. And um, these chevron defects occur for the following reason hmm? um, in bars. Yeah? Um, because when we are reducing bars, the diameter of the bars, you have plastic deformation inside the die, yes? And if the plastic deformation zone, yes, does not reach to the center of the bar, yes? So if there, are, if there is a part of the bar that does not deform, we call this the dead zone, yes? So the, in the dead zone, there is no deformation, yes? yes? Well, then uh, this part deforms and this part deforms and, de and the dead zone will crack, basically. Yeah? Obviously because it doesn't become longer, yes? It should crack, it will crack. Uh, and this depends very much on the, this angle here of the drawing die and the amount of deformation that we give, yes? And so, um, so if the, if the angle is very small, of course, we get safe situation, yes? If the angle is very, uh, very large, yeah? very steep, yeah? like in this case, then we get shaving, that's also not very good, yes? And um, so what you, what you need to have, and you also want to avoid this intermediate stage where you have a dead zone, a dead zone, deformation dead zone, where you, uh, you start making uh, chevron marks, okay? Straightening and finishing of the ends of the bars is very important, yes? So this is, um, so you have uh, chamfering machines which uh, will change the, uh, the ends of the, uh, the bar, for instance. In this case, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a tube or, uh, um, yes, and, and the end finishing here, this, the, the end. Yeah, so it has to be, of course, uh, flat and uh, of high quality. The straightening happens, is done in special straightening machines. Yeah, so this, this is what it looks like. You have uh, in the bar straightening machines. Uh, if you have round bars, you typically have a, a pair of uh, rolls that are shaped, yes? You can see they're not flat, they're, they're rolled, like, they're, they're shaped like this, yeah? And this one is shaped like this, and they're crossed, yes? So um, when, when the bar passes through, it, it turns. It does two things, it turns and it's, and it's being slightly bent when it goes through these rolls, yes? In order to keep it in place, if I look um, uh, from the front, yes, there are guides. Yeah? So, so the bar is, is, is basically getting little def amounts of deformations uh, back and forth so that it becomes straight. And uh, there are similar uh, types of equipment uh, for if you're... Um, if your bar is a, is a square bar, yes, and not a round bar, you have uh, profile straighteners, yes. Okay, very important for bars, yes, and, and profiles, mm, is that there, 
you need to test them. You need to test them to check the internal quality. We've just seen that uh, you have these chevron marks. The chevron marks are absolutely not visible from outside, from the outer side. So you need to uh, do a surface quality of your uh, material. So you have to make sure there are no cracks, for instance, at the surface. Yes? And you do this with um, eddy current testing. That's the most uh, common method, is eddy current testing. You can also do it with automatic visual inspection. Otherwise, you have to do it. You know, there has to be an inspector who will actually inspect all the, the tubes that's, um, or, or the bars. That's usually the, the production rates are too high for one person to do this. So, but you can still, but you can do this with a computer who will recognize. Um, so the, the, you will take images of the, the product as it comes out, and um, and uh, analyze the the images and make reports about um, uh, the defects it's detected. Yes. Um, the other method is uh, eddy current testing. It's where. Uh, electrical nature, and both of these methods, because they, you can automate them, are very popular lately. Yeah? Um, and then when it comes to the internal inspection, you cannot use eddy currents uh, testing, because eddy current testing is only sensitive to uh, surface defects. And of course, visual inspection, whether it's an, uh, a person or a uh, a uh, camera or with a camera, uh, it's the same thing. You can only see the ex exterior. So uh, with ultrasonic testing, yes, you can do internal inspection. Yes, and nowadays uh, you have, for instance, these new probes, phase array probes. You can basically test 100% of your production. Yes, and. Uh, make sure that there are no internal defects, in particular that there are no uh, things like chevron marks. Hmm? Um, right, so um, bar and rods, uh, interpass times and strain rates are, can be very high, deformation rates, yes. Um, I'm gonna talk about this too much. Um, with uh, wire and bar roll, there is absolutely no reason why you cannot use um, uh, alternative or, or, or newer uh, processing methods at, at when you do the deformation at high temperature. So you, yes, you can do standard rolling or normalizing rolling or thermomechanical rolling of, of these steels, yes. Um, and again, um, and use uh, concepts like the ones we use for a thermomechanical processing of strip. You can apply these concepts to uh, wire and bar products, okay? So uh, we've discussed this at length and there's no difference in the approach. Let's have a look now at some uh, uh, products, uh, specific products. Hmm? So in um, when we come to uh, wire products, wire products, these are the five groups of uh, applications which are the most important one. Tire cord steel, cold heading quality steel, spring steel, bearing steel, and free cutting steels. And what is important in each application is strength, yes, uh, certainly in the two top ones, but in an application like spring steels, it's fatigue is extremely important, yes. And in case of bearing steels and um, spring steels, cleanliness is extremely important. You, you don't want to have uh, material failure due to non-metallic inclusions. And the last application, free cutting steels, that's where you make small steel parts, yes, um, you have the requirement of machinability is important. Let me just to, to uh, wrap up this uh, part and uh, say a few things about bars, yes? So bars, we're talking about uh, heavier sections, yes? So these are typical 
uh, applications. You have shafts. Yes. Typical example here is a forged crankshaft. Yes. You have gears. Yes. That are, uh, for instance, uh, this is uh, uh, gear uh, for tra for trans car tr transmission of the car. Yes. Um, you have uh, induction harnable steels that are used uh, in treated um, condition. For instance, uh, this bar there. There's an application stabilizing bars are used uh, for the steering of all vehicles, uh, trucks and um, uh, auto, um, cars, yes. So they are usually, uh, these are usually bars that are uh, hot formed and quenched. And then we also have heavy springs. Yeah? So applications such as these, very heavy uh, springs such as railroad cars, yes. Okay, so we'll talk about these in more detail uh, when we meet next uh, Tuesday. <laughs>